Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, wonderful to have you with us tonight. It's 544. I'm a little bit ahead of schedule. But I want to test out a couple things, as per usual, with you. And you'll see why in just a second. Hello, Lynn. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, let's, um, hello there, Miss Koff, Amanda, Karen, these are all familiar looking names, Jason, hello, hello, Tim, yeah, man, Happy to have you with us. Okay, uh, I've got these chairs set up uh, much closer to you all, and here's what I'd like to try with you. Uh, thank you for arriving early to help me test things out. I'm going to go sit in that chair right now, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions from there, and then I'm going to hustle over here and see if your answers are correct or even if you heard me, okay? Ten, ten, ten. Green Bay, Wisconsin. Okay, that's great. Good, good, good. Your kitchen. Good to hear. Uh, you'll see why we're doing that in just a second, but uh, the wind is just starting to calm down. We've had 40 mile an hour winds this afternoon, uh, but it's calming down. It's darn brisk, but I, I think we're doing well. So hang tight for a bit. I've got the laptop rolling properly. And uh, I'll, come be, I'll come back and chit-chat in, uh, in just a few with you. So you guys are checking in on your own, and that's great. Um, uh, I have been asked by a number of you, you know, do I, do I see your comments afterwards? Like, do I watch these things afterwards to see all the comments? And I definitely do. Um, that's kind of my nightly ritual. I get done with you. I plug everything in back in the house. I take a long walk without listening to anything, just kind of unwind a little bit. 
hey mom and um and then i come back and uh by that point liz is in bed and Bijou's is all tucked away and i put the headphones on and i i watch the replay of of what we did so it's always great to not only see your questions and i always kind of feel badly because i i didn't catch a lot of those questions in real time but whatever and I also see all the other chit chat in lowercase that uh, is going on. So it's always a thrill to have so many of you here. And I, I think tonight might be a very special treat for you. And um, I gotta go wash my hands. You got any luck over there? Not really? <coughs> Just a YouTube channel, Nick Zentner. So how are we doing tonight? Does anybody want to ask anything before we start? We've got a few extra minutes. Uh, our special guest is here and he's trying to find this program on his phone. <laughs> uh, what's the temperature there? Yeah, it's um, probably 43 degrees with about a 20 mile an hour wind. So it's, it's brisk. I've got a few layers on, but I still prefer being outdoors than uh, inside. It's choppy, well that's no good. Seattle, Washington, hello Cecilia. Uh, would you mind chiming in? Is anybody else having stream problems tonight? That's a, I, I hope the answer is no. Is the, is the audio and video okay? I've stopped asking about that. Rhyolite, Jason. Oh, I hear my voice. You got, you're live over there? Okay, uh, sharp, good and clear, looking good tonight. Thank you, thanks. Okay, I'm, I'm relieved. Uh, good. Let me do a test with uh, sitting in chairs, okay? I'm gonna sit in one chair and you tell me uh, if I'm out of frame or not. I think I'm in frame with both of these chairs, but let me try this real quick with you, okay? I'm sorry, by the way, I've been doing this. It's 5.52. Our program will begin at six o'clock. My brother just sent me a message. He said, go sit in the red chair. Good. So you must do have this, found this, it. This is you, okay, good. Richard. Rick, hey Rick. hey Rick, I'm glad you found us, man. This is you, have a seat. Do what, right. do what your brother tells you to do. What time is it? 5.53. I'm gonna ask them if they can see both of us. I was out here playing with these chairs. So I got two questions, I got three questions from you. Can you hear me right now? Can you read the text that's on this board? And Rob is sitting in this chair right now with his drink, and I'm sitting in my chair, and are we both within your frame? Only one of us is going to be sitting at a time. But are we looking good? I mean, well, we know we're looking good. I'm looking good. <laughs> 
can you see both of us? Okay, let me take a look. I'm going to go to the laptop so I can scroll back. Too far away, Dutchman. Dutchman, you'll see what we're doing in just a second. Whoa. <laughs> far away to read you're kidding me it says six feet arrows going like that I thought that was so clever but you can't see it all right uh, both in frame both in frame okay can barely hear me that's okay so I might as well tell you the plan right up front we're taking our social distancing seriously. This is obviously a serious situation around the world. So we are not violating anything along those lines. And I hope that we don't have a ton of comments talking about that sort of thing. Um, we're sitting six feet apart from each other. Uh, when I'm up here, Rob's gonna be back in the chair there. Uh, when he's coming up here, I'm gonna be six feet away from him. We have two buckets of hot water and some soap. I'm going to try my best not to handle the samples that Rob brought to us. And Rob is a gold miner, so I think you know what the samples are going to be. And uh, I'm going to be sitting, when we do our live q and I'm going to be sitting in that chair and feeding, I'm going to be sitting with my laptop and I'm going to be feeding questions to Rob. I was just curious if you'll be able to faintly hear, so I might shout my questions, not only to him, but so that he doesn't have to repeat the questions when we do that. That's the kind of game plan. So before we begin for real, in four minutes, you're gonna start with me as per usual. I'm gonna talk for 10 minutes, probably a little more. Uh, but I want to lay the groundwork for our discussion. Whoops. And I'm gonna Grab the camera without killing the live stream. That's the hope. We're going to do some show and tell with Rob, probably two different times. He's got two kind of groups of deposits. And then as per usual, once we're done with our kind of uh, freelancing off of each other, then we'll open it up to the live Q&A. And that's when I'm going to park myself over there uh, in my chair. And uh, Rob will be standing here talking into the camera. You okay with that? When we do the live Q&A at the end, I'll just... Um, you're talking right into the camera. Yeah, whatever works for you, man. Okay. He's such a nice guy. Uh, yeah, I need to concentrate for just a couple of seconds here. Two minutes or so. And then we'll begin. Cecilia, thou, those are a lot of icons. Or what, what do you call those? Emojis. YouTube emojis. I didn't even know that existed. So Rob's brother has... Struggled, but has found us and watching live. Sam is uh, out of frame for good. <laughs> Beezer's out here somewhere. He may make an appearance. So glad you're with us. Well, if it was 1918, you're isolated with the Spanish flu, and there is no talking to anybody. It's pretty amazing so, what we have today. If it was spring, we'd be warm right now. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? I, the first few live streams I was doing it was like 75, 60 degrees, 65 degrees. You cut out pretty quick with this live stream thing. I'm kind of proud of myself, actually. You know? oh. it, uh, I was debating between Facebook Live and Instagram has a video, so all these social media things have their own little uh, things, but so I kind of took a little straw poll with these folks and they thought, YouTube's the way to go. It's maybe tough for some to find it. Once they get there, they can subscribe and apparently the quality is a little better than the other. And these phones, I mean, the microphone and it's amazing. I don't know if they can hear us right now, but from okay. this far away. We better not talk any shit about it. <laughs> I'll talk some shit about my brother later. Uh-oh. <laughs> Let's not get into that. <laughs> what do you got there? What are you drinking? Uh, kind of a 
vodka tonic. Just do it. Let me see your neck. You've been pretty lucky so far. The weather has been fairly decent. Had the little squall come through, a little bit of rain. You better silence that phone, man. I'm going to have to bark at you during, during class. This is, this is the most text I've ever gotten on this. Well, this is a big moment. You probably got somebody else who wants. I can see you right now. Somebody texting you. Good. All right. Tell Nick your dad and sister in law are watching too. We want a shout out. I've never done a shout out. Who, what are their names? Ruth and Rick. Ruth and Rick, hello. And, and my dad, Mike, they're together. And Rob's dad, Mike, and we're ready to go. Let's do it. Turn that phone off. And quit, quit texting me. I'm Jeez. in the middle of something. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. This is Ellensburg, Washington, USA, and you are watching live from home here uh, in our backyard. Uh, there's a special guest with us today. His name is Rob Reppin, and we're going to involve him as quickly as possible. But I feel like I want to give a little background and get us into this the best that we can, especially since we've been meeting so often recently with these live streams, and we have a little background on basalts, on different kinds of basalts, different ages of basalts, and the basalt is part of our story again tonight. The game plan very quickly is a little quick talk from me, hopefully, some show and tell with Rob where I'm going to grab the camera and look at some of the things that he's brought in. Uh, back to me a little bit more, back to Rob show and tell, and then when it's time, hopefully about 6.30, maybe a little bit after, we'll get rolling with some live Q&A. So if you have questions that are prompted from what you see, or you already have questions chambered for Rob, we'll go for it and try to answer as many as we can. That's the game plan. We're staying a safe distance from each other. There he is. He's not moving for a while. Let's begin. Let's get right into it, okay? There is gold in the area. And the gold is part of a community that has been a closed community for a long time. I'm approaching 30 years of teaching here in the community, in the college, at the college here in Ellensburg, and I knew nothing about the gold in Liberty, which is a half an hour drive to the north of town, because I couldn't find much online about the geology of Liberty and the gold deposits. I couldn't find much in university libraries. It was very difficult to find information. And at one point, I just kind of gave up and said, well, I don't know anybody up there in Liberty. I'll never figure this out. I'll just ignore it. And about five years ago, Rob heard that I was offering a Geology 101 class free for the public, which I do regularly. So he drove in from his gold mine every morning during the winter of whatever, 2014 or something, and took the class. And then after the class was done, Rob started taking me out to his mine and teaching me about the gold deposits one-on-one. -on -one. And he had pet ideas and he had obvious things that would be helpful to me. And so he has been a great service to me and ultimately to you. We did a lecture on YouTube oh, five years ago that you can find, a full hour lecture. Rob has a YouTube channel. He's got some videos that he shot when he was actually prospecting, and those are fun to watch. And so this is kind of a compliment to this. If you feel like you've heard it all already and you've seen all that stuff, we have some new ideas and some updated versions of what's going on with Rob in the last few years. So even if you're a veteran of the scene, please stick around and I hope that you'll enjoy what we have for you tonight. Okay, great. We're going to Liberty, Washington. That's Seattle. That's Wenatchee. Spokane is off the map. This is a landmark called Mount Stewart, which we'll be talking about this weekend. I'll make sure to give you the schedule for Saturday and Sunday before too long. And here's my backyard. So Liberty is between Ellensburg and Mount Stewart. And when we talked about the Ellensburg blue agates a few nights ago, 
I had a diagram that looks like this. This one looks a little different, but it should look familiar to you. So let's focus on this and realize that there's lots going on in the Liberty area. All right, let me do this quickly as I can. We have folded sedimentary layers, sandstones and shales. Collectively, that's called the Swak Formation. And those rock layers were deposited between 59 and 49 million years ago. Fine. Those rocks, especially the plant fossils that are in those rocks, are tropical plants. That means it was a Florida-like scene here between 59 and 49 million years ago. Central Florida, the Everglades, that whole scene was here in central Washington between 59 and 49. This is before the Cascades. This is before Mount Stewart became an actual mountain peak, although the Mount Stewart rock is older than this time. And those layers were originally flat and they got folded into anticlines and synclines. Okay, we don't have any gold yet. We just have Florida-like sedimentary layers that got folded. The big star of the show is an event that happened 49 million years ago. And we were talking about it when we talked about the El Ellensburg Blue Agates. It's the Tianaway Basalt event, a relatively quick event. We don't know how quick, but magically cracks opened up in the swamp and Hawaiian-like lava came up those cracks and flooded the surface with basalt. And you're like, oh yeah, German chocolate cake. We did that last time or two nights ago, and even last night. Oh yeah, I know about the German chocolate cake. Be careful now. This is not the German chocolate cake. I don't have a cake tonight. I don't have a drill tonight. This is a much smaller scale flood basalt story. We really can't even call it a flood basalt officially. So just in central Washington, we are burying the swamp with Tianue basalt but it's not the German chocolate cake. So the thing I want to do on the chalkboard very quickly is make sure that we keep the German chocolate cake and the huge flood basalts of the Pacific Northwest as a separate topic from tonight. So 16.7, remember? That's when those cracks, let's just say 16. 16 million years ago, Do you remember this from a couple nights ago? The cracks started down in northern Nevada, where the Yellowstone hotspot was located. And then those cracks, do you remember, from the flood basalts live stream, propagated their way into Washington. And the, the cracks were active here about 16 million years ago. And we had flood basalts, basically Wenatchee, getting close to Liberty, but again, they don't help us tonight. And then we're flooding much of Oregon, essentially. What I'm telling you is, ignore that tonight, please. Please ignore the German chocolate cake. Please ignore this basalt, which is 16 million years old. Instead, tonight, we want to go 49 million years ago. 49. But the reason I'm trying to emphasize this is it's the same kind of a story where we have cracks, where we have feeder dikes, where we have basalt flooding to the surface, and where we have the surface being buried in lava. But these cracks, the feeder dikes in the Liberty area that are gonna help us understand why the gold is there, look like that. Smaller scale. We don't really know how much of Washington was buried by the Tianue basalt. In fact, we just have a narrow band of Tianue basalt today, and we have a narrow band of where these cracks are. But please notice, I'm going to put the number, <coughs> the basalt, the Tianue basalt, the feeder dikes that factor into the wire gold that we're about to talk about, the gold is talking about this story related 49 million years ago. Very quickly, why are these cracks here? That's the coin purse. That's the coin purse that I used the other night. Oh, I hate it now. This cold purse is really not working when it's cold. Okay, you, you squeeze the coin purse 
and you open the cracks, and if you remember that, that's because of the uh, arrival of Silesia, a discussion for this weekend. So we bring in this major exotic terrain, we slam it onto the edge of the Pacific Northwest, we have compression northeast-southwest, and we open these cracks, and the cracks are not only opening, but they're sending basalt to the surface. I'm done. I'm done with that. Now, to set up Rob's first show and tell, I think we're going to do it in just a second. Do you see what I have here? You know what I'm going to do? It's gold the rest of the night. There's two very different kinds of gold deposits in the Liberty area. I mean, it'd be fine if we just had one kind, but we have two very different kinds of gold in the Liberty area. Hard rock gold deposits and placer gold deposits. I would like us to do one at a time. So the placer is going to be our nuggets. That's got some question mark and some stories. That's coming in a bit, but we're not doing that now, okay? Instead, I'm going to call Rob over in just a bit. I'm going to grab this camera. We're going to do a little bit of show and tell. And before I get Rob over, I want to show you where he's finding his hard rock gold. He's finding his hard rock gold, first of all, in a very specific form. It's called wire gold. And Rob taught me that much of the wire gold is found in calcite veins. Oh, really? Well, where's the calcite veins? Calcite's a pretty soft mineral. The calcite veins are always in black shale. Oh, really? Well, where's the black shale? That's this fat black line here and this fat black line here. The Swak Formation is alternating sandstones and shales. So here's where the hard rock wire gold deposits are always found until Rob corrects me tonight, because I'm learning some new stuff from him, I think, tonight as well. As I've been teaching it, these gold stars are where you find the wire gold. And Rob has at least one mine shaft where he's at these gold stars. What's the recipe then for wire gold? You have to have wire gold in calcite veins within black shale, and you need to be right next door to one of these cracks that was filled with lava. We call this a feeder dike. That's why the Tianue event is part of this story. You're not finding wire gold over here. You're not, you have to be next door to one of these feeder dikes of basalt, Tianue basalt, 49 million years old. And the last thing I say, I promise, is that that does not exactly mean that the wires of gold are 49 million years old. We don't really know the age of mineralization of when the gold was actually deposited. Rob's gonna help us with a few of his ideas with that. Okay, let's visit with Rob. Let's look at some wire gold and anything else he wants to talk about with hard rock deposits. And we're gonna to try to keep our six feet of separation. Oh, Rob! I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip this around. Would you like to say hi to your new friends here? My new friends? Do a shout out to Dad. <laughs> Where, <let's see. laughs> Ray and Scott too. There oh, one. good, 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 good. Okay, so I want to look at some of this wire gold with you to start, and then we'll go anywhere you want to go with uh, discussion or showing us or both, all in that hard, uh, uh, that hard rock category. So what do you got? What'd you bring in? That's that's that. Do you have any of that fragile wire gold? Yes, I do. Um, there's placer gold in Liberty. There's also wire gold, but there's also the traditional hard rock. Some of the terminology gets uh, crossed over. Okay. Right, so you have pocket mining and your normal hard rock mining. Okay. So right below you here is a quartz breccia. Quartz. 
So I was talking calcite. So you're saying there's heart, there's fragile wire gold also with the quartz? Uh, there is. Okay. Um, this this is a, a quartz vein anywhere in the world can carry gold. So that's your normal hard rock gold mine. Okay. So within this quartz breccia, there's little tiny specks of gold that get you crush this rock up and get the little tiny flecks out of it. They're having a hard time hearing you. The pockets of wire gold are not in this quartz breccia. Okay. They're in the black shale. So a sample of the black shale. Okay. There's, there's carbon in this black shale. Pretend you're talking to Sam. There's carbon in this black shale that attracts gold initially when it's in a solution. Okay. So within cavities, like this little calcite seam inside the black shale, layer yeah. of the black shale, mm -hmm. that at one time was an open space. Okay. So a hydrothermal solution that had gold dissolved in it flowed through that open space. Okay. The black shale helped to precipitate the gold out of its solution, and the, and little tiny particles of gold started little attaching themselves to the wall of this cavity, forming pockets of wire gold. And the calcite came in later and solidified around the gold that was already in the cap in the cavity. Got it. All right. So that's that's your your pocket ore for liberty. Okay. Black shale and calcite. You got some wire right in there, or that not yet? Um, there is some gold in okay. this. It's too, it's too fine to see. I got a couple okay. of samples with gold in. Oh, you're here. warming us up. You're teasing us. I uh, see how I'm this teasing. works. All right. So here's. You're a master. Here's a piece of carbonaceous black shale with calcite. Okay. That once I dissolve the calcite away, we reveal the. Oh, damn. The crystalline wire gold is hiding inside the calcite. Set it down for a sec, would you please? And I'm going to focus in on it. So you collect that from your hard rock mine and then you dissolve. How do you dissolve the calcite away? Uh, with a, with a mild, a mild uh, muriatic acid dissolves calcite very easily. To reveal that gold that was captured or enclosed, packaged, if you will, inside the calcite, 44 million years ago, if that's the actual date of mineralization. Right. The gold form, the calcite packaged around the gold, preserved it. When I dissolved the calcite away from that gold, it revealed this massive wire gold in its exact condition it was in 44 million years ago. Okay. That's your best guess based on one report, the 44, but you're not totally convinced it's I'm 44. I'm totally convinced. I think there are multiple episodes of mineralization in the area. Yeah. Um, here's one more piece of the Good. wire gold and black shale. Okay. It's all the way to reveal the, the wires. Hold it as steady as you can. Oh, son of a buck. Can you rotate it slowly now? Oh, daddy. <laughs> Found the sweet spot. <laughs> God, that's it's nice. Stuff. Did you did you dissolve some of that away, or it wouldn't just be hanging out there like that, would None it? None of this gold was visible when I chipped this rock out of its vein. So okay. I dissolved the calcite away to reveal. Are you working with like a backhoe or something, or a hand pick, or like that's so delicate? How are you not busting it all up? Um. Your traditional hard rock gold mine is busting everything up, crushing it to powder and recovering the gold. These wire gold specimens are worth a lot more money. You don't want to destroy them. So it's an extremely tedious I'll bet. operation to, to figure out which of these rocks have gold in them to start with. Generally with a little real fine, uh, delicate pinpointer, sensitive pinpointer. Okay. Detector. Yeah. Yeah. Then you dissolve the calcite away. Gosh. So it's very, very tedious. Uh, pocket mining is the most difficult. Why do you say pocket? Did you already cover that? Sorry. Uh, because the wire gold happens in very, very compact, small pockets that might have 100 ounces, might have 100 pounds, 120 pounds in 1956, in a very compact area, maybe three or four feet square. Hmm. It's a pocket. In, 
between the pockets, which might be 20, 30, 40, 100 feet apart, there's nothing. Which is why pocket mining is, is a small minor specialty. Yeah. The company couldn't afford to do it. Right. But you're, you're always with, sorry, folks, uh, you're always close to one of those dikes. You never have this wire away from a dike. The basalt intrusive came through a fracture in the earth, cooled, and some point after the basalt came through that fracture, hydrothermal solutions followed the same fracture. Let's get to that diagram. I can't be too close to you, but... Uh, So you you point and give us a sense of how you think those fluids are kind of passing through, or do you have any idea why are the anticlines the place where a lot of the hard rock crystals are found? Uh, personally, I think because the, on the anticlines, there's less resistance, I believe, to fluid movement. Less resistance, okay? Versus the syncline. The syncline, you're... you're Fluid's, try, fluid's trying to be pushed down on a syncline. Okay. It comes up easily on the anticline. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any other hard rock uh, samples that you want to show us? We can always come back to some things. Or is there another angle to this uh, that we're not just that you feel would be appropriate to throw in right now? Like it's 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 the basalt, it's the red, white, and blue thing, and all that. And are you saying there's some quartz veins in your property that I didn't really know about that you're that have not been? None of my mine. There okay. Are quartz, there are your traditional quartz mines with very fine particles of gold disseminated within the quartz that you have to crush to recover the gold out. Okay. They are in the Liberty area, um, but also within the black shales. I think the same hydrothermal solution events. Yeah. Uh, there may have been several. So in the bird's eye quartz, you have your traditional hard rock mine. Yeah. Your hard rock mine. Yeah. The same solution possibly as it passes by the carbonaceous black shale, which really sucks the gold out, forms the pockets and very encased, enclosed, condensed little areas. So this, this is this what one. all gold in Liberty starts off as, is clusters, all the way up to five pounds of this is kind of five to seven pounds. Masses of wire gold have historically been found in Liberty. So all the gold nuggets, these well, guys. We're not there yet, but go ahead, yeah. Originated as wire gold. This is straight out of the load, the pocket, the vein. This gets weathered out of its vein through natural erosion processes okay kind of works its way downstream if it gets if that massive wire gold gets into a river channel it will eventually be pounded into one of these nuggets well let's roll with it so you've got a good sample that shows the transition between what we were looking at here which is the kind of original fragile wires and we're about to discuss these amazing nuggets that are found just two miles away or something Very short amazing. Distance. Very short distance. And, so, and I'm suspicious always about the transition from that to that in two miles, but would you mind showing us that transition between those two? The transition piece between the two. Uh-oh. <laughs> I had a couple neighbors walk by. Should I go run, run them down? I should have thought ahead. I, I told Bijou to protect this place. We got valuable stuff in the backyard. Seriously, you don't know where it is? Let me stall for you. Oh, here it is. It's, okay. It's under these photos. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll set it up first. Go ahead. The beautiful, bright, crystalline wire from you gold you just saw in the matrix. Yeah. Out of the load. As it erodes, and starts to work its way downhill, you, you get what they call alluvial gold that has been transported from its original source just through erosion, but not gotten into a stream course. Oh my God. So, so this piece right here. What in the heck? This is a massive crystalline wire gold that eroded out of its original vein 
but it hasn't gotten into a river channel to get tumbled into one of the nuggets. Do you mind? So that piece right there. Compared to the piece in the pocket. This is a piece of, that's a one ounce piece of Liberty Gold that originated as a piece like this that got into a river course and got pounded, condensed into a smooth, cold nugget. Just by moving down the stream, I don't. Not so much the movement of the gold itself, because it's so heavy. It'll get it'll it'll lodge itself in the little crack or crevice along the okay. bedrock of the stream course. But other rocks will continually pound over the top of it and smash it. God dang! The smooth nuggets. So which so which one of these is heavier? This one's one ounce. The one you're holding although it's much larger, is only two-thirds of an ounce because it hasn't gotten pounded into uh, a smooth nugget yet. Huh. You had those in your pocket? I think I have one or two in my pocket. You do? So both, both of those are one-ounce nuggets from Liberty. <laughs> and, of course, I take some of my fine gold, like this real fine stuff that has no real nugget value. Yeah. So I, I melt it down and I do different things. And one of the things I did was I made my own gold coin the way that, with the way the Turks invented coinage. Is that you? Am I supposed to be? <laughs> <laughs> made my own stamp of diamond rods. You know, smack it with a hammer the way they... Uh, so I got my own gold coin with my Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, and here's some more of the... That's pretty much your typical of most people that are able to find little pickers. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, let's take a let's go back to those vials in a second. Let's take a break from your show and tell. Let me go to that other whiteboard. We'll back up. We'll make sure we know why we're suddenly looking at nuggets, and then we'll come back and do a little bit more of the the okay. nugget stuff. Does that sound fine? You gotcha. And I'll keep my distance. I knew that was going to happen. I was going to get too excited and get. Get too close. Oh, that's why we got what? That's why we got that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> oh shit! I just turned. Hit the off button. You still with us? All right. I'm I'm shaking right now. I'm too excited. I don't know about you. Uh, I'm gonna wash my hands. Next step. Here, here. Yeah, hit me. Hit me, baby. <laughs> Petrified wood is a soap dish. All right. So we're on schedule. Hope you're feeling okay about what we're doing, enjoying what we've got. Uh, the live Q and A is coming, but we're not there yet. We've got more nuggets to look at, but I wanna do just a little bit more teaching. And if you're here only for the gold, you know, you're like, screw that guy, I just wanna look at more gold. Give me a chance, all right? Rob has given me these as gifts. Uh, one is a thank you for the class, and another one I kind of forget what the occasion was, but I guess this is small stuff compared to what we were just looking at. Screw it. All right. Okay. We're done talking about the cracks. That's obviously a part of the story. And we're done now talking about the hard rock. We'll come back to this if you have questions about this, but let's transition now to those nuggets. The nuggets are a whole different story. So just a little bit, if you don't have any sense of where we're talking, you know that we're talking about Liberty, which is halfway between Ellensburg and Mount Stewart. Liberty is along a creek called Swat Creek. Swat Creek basically drains away from Blewett Pass, if you know Blewett Pass, driving over to the north to Wenatchee or Leavenworth, if you hang a left. 
Uh, what other landmarks would be known to you? The Liberty Cafe, there's Tianoi Basalt right there. Um, I'm saying this because Rob's hard rock stuff and those fragile wires and the calcite and all that that we were just talking about is up in the hills above Liberty, two miles basically away from US 97, where there's tons of traffic, you know, Seattle to their second home in Chelan or whatever. But Rob's other place where he lives is right next to US 97. And he's not finding wire gold down along Swat Creek. He's not finding wire gold at all. Except I guess he is if we realize that these nuggets are those wires that are compacted. We saw the transition from the wire that was up in the hills, move it out of the hills, pack those wire wires together to form the gold nuggets themselves. So if you're brand new to gold in, at all, if you're a child watching right now, I'm glad that you're with us. You have heard of gold nuggets. You've heard of panning for gold. Rob has a pan with him so he can share some of his secrets of how he pans for gold. But the panning for gold is not the wire stuff. The panning for gold is looking for these nuggets. Forget about the panning for just a second, and let me try to explain what is known, at least to me, and what to me is a major question, and I think it is to Rob too. Down there low, with his placer mines, so he's got mine shafts that are literally, that were literally hand dug by the miners, you know, the gold rush in the Liberty area was in 1873. So there's a huge, you know about gold rushes. So there was one. <coughs> so there's Rob walking into one of his mine tunnels with his placer operation. And he has a whole network of tunnels that he can answer your questions about. So the walls of the tunnels are river rock. That's kind of disconcerting if you're not used to being in a scene like that. But those river cobbles are very well cemented together. They have some strength to them. And I'm hoping that you're able to understand what I'm trying to draw here. I'm trying to draw that he has on average 50 feet of river cobbles. And most of those river cobbles are worthless. They don't have gold in them. But in green down here, in the bottom foot, bottom two feet, even going down into the cracks in the upper part of the bedrock that's more than 50 million years old, that's what Rob calls the pay layer. So he's mining his placer operations to haul out a bunch of these river rocks, but he's got his eye specifically on this pay layer where in addition to loose river cobbles, there are nuggets of gold, big and small. And he's brought some of those nuggets in. You just saw a glimpse. We'll look at more of them carefully in just a second and talk about if he's still finding nuggets today. The major question mark I have from my angle, which is just kind of an academic angle, and it might actually have some bearing on prospecting, is where exactly did these river cobbles come from? That was my first impression when I was first invited to, to visit Rob's place. I'm like, these cobbles are huge. They're the size of my head and bigger. And there's 50 feet of them. And this area, this drainage area between Blewett Pass and Rob's mine is not a very big watershed. So I don't get where all those rocks are coming from. So an obvious thing to do as a geologist would be to pick through each of those rocks, catalog, take an inventory, how many are basalt, are there granites, are there rhyolites, are there rocks from Snoqualmie Pass, are there rocks from God knows where. But that has not been done. To me, that's a big story, a big question mark. And I think there might, this is me talking now, not Rob. I think it's possible that the placer river cobbles, meaning placer just means water is carrying them and dropping them, just like any old river rock. We had a whole thing about ancient rivers, remember? So you got a bunch of river cobbles, fine. We know that a river was flowing through there at one time. 
I am wondering if that river had a much longer length. I'm wondering if the river cobbles at Rob's place came from half a state away, or at least another county away, instead of just between Rob's place and, and Swak Pass, a beaver, a Blewett Pass. There's another angle, at least in the literature, and that I promise we're going back to Rob. Possibly there's an Ice Age story here. I don't have a map handy. I thought I did, but I don't. Uh, I'll just verbally say it. There was a glacier, if you know central Washington, there was a glacier called the Yakima Valley Glacier. I'll draw it really quick. I promise, really quick. Here's Snoqualmie Pass. Seattle's over here. Ellenburg over here. Oh no, I gotta make it bigger. Ellensburg's over here. There was a mountain glacier called the Yakima Valley Glacier that flowed, we know this, there's all sorts of glacial deposits. The Yakima Valley Glacier started at Snoqualmie Pass and flowed right down Interstate 90. It flowed over Hayak, the Yakima Valley Glacier, a mountain glacier, followed the valley, it followed the Yakima River, it flowed to Easton. The Yakima Valley Glacier went to downtown uh, Cleelum. And then just past Cleelum, there's a place called Lookout Mountain. It's a big mountain full of German chocolate cake. And that mountain, Lookout Mountain, was so big that it caused the Yakima Valley Glacier to split. And half of the Yakima Valley Glacier flowed to the left of Lookout Mountain and set up shop at Swak Prairie. And the other half of the Yakima Valley Glacier went right and set up shop, in other words, ended at a place called Thorpe Prairie. Swak Prairie and Thorpe Prairie. What am I doing? I thought we were talking about gold tonight. Why am I talking about a glacier? The only real geologist who's been in there to map the quaternary deposits, it's a guy named Richard Waite, and he did this at the beginning of his career in the mid-1970s. And Richard Waite said, I see all of Rob's river cobbles, and I think those river cobbles are from the glacier. I think those river cobbles got brought down from Snoqualmie Pass by the ice, and then running water was flowing from the melting glacier and flowing up Swak drainage as opposed to coming down. Does that help us understand the gold? Maybe not. But maybe the river cobbles above are from Snoqualmie Pass and not from a distant source. So to me, those are some of the questions to be answered in the next generation or two. And that's why, one of the reasons I like that area. More show and tell, more nuggets with Rob right now, and then we'll set up for some live Q&A. Okay, Rob. Thanks for coming back. You're, you didn't leave yet. That's good. You didn't leave me all your gold. Okay. All right. Okay. So I cut you off before when you were going into your vials there. So can you give us a little better look at some of your good placer stuff? Or did you want to comment on any of the stuff I was just mentioning that may or may not have validity? I think it's a valid point that the Stepalmy glaciers off of Stepalmy Pass could have backed up into Swat Creek drainage. Yeah. The problem is all those boulders are basalt in the upper 50 feet of gravel. Your river cobbles are mostly basalt. They're basalt. Okay. It, it wouldn't match what was coming down from Stepalmy Pass. Okay. So that's new to me that these most of these river cobbles are basalt, which means they're probably more local than they are regional. Probably more local. The only boulders that I've recognized in the, in the entire Swak drainage are basalt or about 5% are of a diorite okay. versus basalt. Those are the only two boulders that are in the Swak drainage that I've recognized. Okay. 
and they're worthless to you. You just want to get rid of all that river, all, all that river rock. You got to get rid of it to get down to your. All of this from all the way down to the bottom two feet is worthless to me. Where, where do you move it? Where, you, got, you got to get rid of that to get to the pay layer. Don't you? Well, in my case, because it's so deep, I have nowhere to put all that 50 feet of ground. Yeah. So I'm forced to go underground with the tunnels. Okay. Because there's nowhere to put. Oh, I see. You're, you're tunneling because. I'm forced to dig out this amount rather yeah. than all of it because I got nowhere to put this. Yeah, yeah. So I'm forced underground. But you're not thinking the gold is coming from Snoqualmie Pass, or are you? No, not at all. The gold that is in Liberty came from Liberty. So the, the, the green stuff is for sure local, you say, and then this stuff that's covering it up could have come from farther away. I still think it's local. You still think it's local, yeah. But we still don't have an explanation of why it got so deep in such a small drainage. Got it, got it. I personally think there was an older channel on Boulder Creek, they call it Boulder Creek for a reason, because it has giant washed boulders, but it's only a few miles long. Okay. The drainage itself is too short to create these giant river-worn boulders. Got it. It heads east, it's headwaters, it's towards the east. Underneath the Yakima Basalts, which I think covered up an older, much longer Boulder Creek, Boulder River. Hmm. That's what I think. Okay. You got some nuggets? Yeah, the jars here, this is this is typical of what comes out of Liberty. I've just screened them to different sizes. So this is your fine gold. These would be your your pickers. You know, you can hear them rattle. And then the nuggets. Liberty is known for coarse gold. Up to five pound single you know, gold nuggets have been found in Liberty history. And the process to get to those is you use a backhoe to scoop out some of the walls of your tunnel and then you uh, eventually... In my tunnel, you have drawn here, I, I dig my tunnels with a hydraulic hammer mounted to the front of a skid steer so I can do much more volume, much longer tunnels in a given day versus pick and shovel. But I only save the bottom two feet, which gets... Uh, process through a wash plant to recover the gold in a sluice box. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I don't know if you got yeah, a man. photo album here. Yeah, your kids. Uh, oh, here, here's an example. These are blown up, of course. These are not actual size. So this, this photo here right up front is this piece of gold. Photo oh, okay. So that's how much it's magnified. Yeah. Uh, but this is just a collection of photographs of gold that I found, pretty much I found 90% of what's in here. That's a six ounce piece I found in 1994. Hey, you want to take that photo album to your chair and I'll come over your shoulder and we'll just sure. do a little, you can just do a little talking and telling us. That might work. We might not have as much glare. Tell me a story, tell me a story, Grandpa, yeah. Can I have a drink, please? Absolutely. <laughs> You're working overtime. You're giving free information out to everybody. Are you, you know? Once again, here's the, kind of the, the sequence of events, the progression. So yep. here's a piece, a mass of crystalline wire gold in the matrix. So from the original source. Okay. When it gets eroded away, here's a piece that has eroded out of its vein. It still has a little bit of, in this case, it's quartz. Okay. Um, but you can see the edges have started to get rounded off because it has entered a stream course, but hasn't tumbled downstream or enough other rocks have tumbled over the top of it yet to turn it into one of these smooth nuggets. So that's the sequence of events. Like get it. These big nuggets. Yeah. God, those are... You, you found all those yourself? Um, this one I found from Mike Corbley in uh, 1994. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to be the one to pick up with the metal detector. That was a fun one. Um, again, eluvial. He wrote it out of its vein, but not yeah. gotten into stream, of course. It's a massive wire. Another one that I've dissolved 
This gold was completely encased in calcite when I found the rock, like the samples I showed you. All I saw was a little tip of a piece of gold point sticking out of really? calcite like that. Really? But a little uh, real sensitive metal detector told me there was something inside. And then uh, actually on this one, there was, there was like a little point of a piece of gold sticking out here and there's a little tiny piece over here somewhere. So I put electrical conductivity tester on it that told me before the calcite was dissolved away that they were connected. So I knew that once I dissolved this, it was going to be something special. Unbelievable. It's tedious work. Oh, God. But they're valuable. Well, that's where you, uh, big dollars far, come from far, that. Far, far more than the, the, the weight, the dollar value of the gold itself because mm. it's a very rare form of gold. Mm. That's a specimen at that point. Okay. So these are all just different crystalline wire gold. What makes crystalline wire gold is these points are actual crystals of gold. That's what makes it so rare. The wires started off as a crystal, got elongated on one axis, and as they were growing out of solution, they branched off dendritically to form all these different shapes. Mm. There's a piece just like I showed, just still in the yeah. black shale, calcite, the rest of that's gold. I appreciate you bringing the book. Uh, I think we got to go to the Q&A now. We got, okay. um, okay. yep, you, you can sit right there if you like or okay. wherever you want to go. Um, actually, no, would you mind standing over here and talking into the camera? It's time for uh, Q&A. Thank you for your patience. It's about um, Quarter to seven. We ran a little long with that. I think we'll go more than 15 minutes is my guess. I want to be a safe distance from Rob, so I'm going to go sit in the chair. And I'm going to, um, what am I going to do? I'm going to read your questions from the laptop, and then Rob's just going to kind of talk into the camera here and maybe get a, a sample or two if he needs it. But for the most part, we'll go for it, okay? Question time. How much money is crystallizing gold per ounce? The wire gold. Uh, the crystallized wire gold uh, on a per ounce basis is really, really tough to do. Uh, the spot price of gold is irrelevant when it comes to specimen gold. Uh, gold crystallizes in many different forms, many different places in the world. Wire gold is one of the rarer. So if it's a good quality specimen with nice, sharp, bright crystals, it, it can go, I know it's hard to believe, but a $5 worth of gold by weight can be worth 500 a 1000 sometimes 5000 if it has perfect crystals on it. So the sky's the limit on some of it. Is there a place today somewhere on Earth where similar hydrothermal vents bring up gold? Yes, absolutely. It's a, Earth is constantly folding in on itself. So yes, there, there are active vein systems today as we speak. Did the Columbia River ever flow through your area? I'm not a believer. I know the... on. The ancient rivers uh, have meandered back and forth, and, and the, the Yakima basalt has pushed the, the Columbia west of where we're standing right here today, Ellensburg. I'm not convinced that it flowed right through the town of Liberty, but I think it came pretty close. Question from Evelyn, age seven. How does the wire gold get loose to become nuggets? I thought you had to use chemicals. Uh, Evelyn, the wire gold becomes loose to become nuggets. First, it's it's in a vein in solid rock in the mountains. So every winter, rocks and rain and snow freezes, and the rocks expand and they crack and they crumble, and little, sometimes large particles of gold are released from their vein, and they slowly start tumbling downhill until they get into a river channel that pounds that piece of gold breaks the quartz the host rock off of it and they turn into nuggets that way just through erosion so the gold is younger than the basalt that is 49 million years old the basalt is 
49 million years old. Does the gold have to be younger? Um, it was the basalt that came through fractures first. There were some hydrothermal solutions alongside the basalts as they were flowing, but I think personally, I think the basalt has at least partially cooled, but hydrothermal solutions are still coming up following the same channels, the same cracks in the Earth's crust that the basalt flowed after. So the water solutions, the, the magma chamber is still hot. The lavas have quit flowing. The magma chamber down deep is still hot. So there's hot solu solutions flowing, heating up at the magma source, but coming alongside the cooled off dikes already. So the Tianue was first, the gold was second. I don't think they came at the same time, but pretty close. Are you still receiving visitors at your Placer mine? And if you are, how do we find your mine and what are your hours? Uh, I still go, I still do get visitors, uh, quite a lot of them. Uh, of course, nowadays things have changed a little bit. Uh, bring your own sanitizer, all that crap. Uh, but it is important. Um, will you, will yeah. you, this fall, will you, will you entertain visitors assuming this all goes away? Oh yeah, yeah, I will. We'll just keep our safe distance. I'll be there. You can come out and visit. How do they find you? Um, well, <laughs> uh, just like Roger found you a few minutes ago, I saw your greenhouse and figured it out. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm on YouTube. I'm not, I'm not hard to find. Fair enough. Does all gold start off as wire gold? In the Liberty area, yes. Every piece of gold, even these, these, these bigger pieces that I pack around, if I was to cut this in half, you would see a smashed matrix of wires inside. So in Liberty, it all originated as a massive wire. Uh, I'll answer a couple quick ones. Could the cobbles have been deposited by a single event such as a lahar? Uh, those cobbles are, are sitting loose next to each other. There's no, there's no matrix. There's no kind of concrete-like stuff that you see in a lahar. So think we can easily rule out a lahar and is shale formed in shallow water yes typically so before the gold was formed before the Tianue event there were swamps and lakes in the area but no connection to the gold um, what causes the gold to attach to the shale Um, carbon is used a lot in, in gold recovery. Uh, activated carbon is very common in, in gold leaching operations, and it's all about the pore size. I, I, I still think, other than the pore size, these little tiny openings in, in activated carbon that trap gold to start with, I still think there's still there's another affinity that gold has with carbon that I don't quite understand yet, but I think it's more than just pore size. Either way, a particle of gold will come out of solution, attach itself either in a pore of carbon, uh, but then once once what I call the seed crystals are started on the walls of this carbon, then. The rest of the solution that still has gold in it, the gold that's still in solution will be attracted to the gold stronger than it was originally by the carbon, and that's how the pockets and the seed crystals get started to form this dendritic gold. Are there any other metals like silver in your gold? Uh, there's no native silver mined out in the Liberty area, but our gold is very high in silver. Um, almost to a point of being called electrum because it has uh, roughly about 20% uh, of the gold. And that's why it has a certain color. Uh, the more pure gold is, the more yellow it is, more buttery yellow it is. This is kind of bright and shiny. So this has 20% silver naturally alloyed with it. But there's no native silver. How warm is it inside the mine? Uh, pretty constant all year round. Um, right around anywhere from 36 to 42 in the wintertime. 
it only varies about at most maybe 10 degrees. So when it's five degrees below outside, it's still 36 inside the tunnels. Do you have a seasonal pattern? Like do you do the placer in the summer and the hard rock in the winter or vice versa? Uh, the hard rock mine, the pocket mines where I look for the wire gold is, is higher up in the mountains. So it's snow bound in the winter time. So my general season is I work in the tunnels on the placer ground down low next to the highway all winter. And if I make enough money to get by, I can go waste that money on looking for a pocket of gold, which is an all or nothing proposition. And usually it's a nothing proposition. You up for a few more or are you frozen? No, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> uh, we'll go another five or six questions if you're okay. Yeah, we're good. Um, why does gold prefer basalt? I'm curious because gold is very stable. Electrolysis? I don't think gold prefers basalt at all. I just think the basalt was the heat source that heated up these hydrothermal solutions from a deep level. So I think, well, I know that that heat source doesn't have to be basalt. It can be granite, it can be diorite, it can be almost any magma chamber is going to create superheated fluids which will dissolve minerals, which will find their way to the surface through pressure. So it's not just that that gold has an affinity for basalt. Basalt just happened to be the heat source. You know, a couple nights ago, I gave people directions to uh, a public place they could go look for Ellensburg blue agates. Is there anything like that with the gold? Is there any place to pan or something? Uh, what I recommend when people want to get started in gold mining is get on the internet and look up some of these various prospecting clubs. And all it costs you 30 to 80 bucks a year for the whole family. The prospecting clubs have mining claims that you have free access to. Uh, you can go yourself, take the family, and, and usually they're pretty decent claims. So that's the best place to start. Join one of the clubs. Uh, we'll do a couple more. How deep do your tunnels run? Uh, they're all on one level because it's the, I follow the bedrock, which is the bottom solid rock that river gravel flowed over the top of. So the bottom is, is fairly level. There's no deep shafts in my case because I'm tunneling into the hillside. But the tunnel system itself on my property, I got just short of about 3,000 feet of tunnel, um, probably half of which I've dug in the last... 12, 13 years. Does having silver and gold make it less valuable? Uh, if you're talking about placer gold, the smooth nuggets, uh, yes, generally speaking, it does. The, the value of gold, depending on how you sell it, varies con considerably. Um, as, as a as a nugget. Okay, so here, here's, two, here's two one ounce nuggets, okay? Um, and it's I have, see, I have the beholder. This one, I think. Yeah, keep pushing in. I think you can push in there. Okay. This one, I think, has a lot more character than this one. This one's kind of smooth, and this one's kind of, it's rough and coarse and has character to it. I would consider this one much more valuable generally speaking this one is so smooth it's it's a perfect pocket piece it's just like it's it's warm to the touch it feels good so the value there there is a there is a nugget value over and above when you get into a certain size piece of gold over and above spot price you're, they're smaller flakes and nuggets the silver takes away from because the, the, a mint has to get that silver out and they charge you to do it. So if it's a big enough nugget, it has added value. If it's just pickers and small nuggets, it has less value. I've always heard that gold can be found with red garnet and quartzite veins. Is that true? 
Uh, if you're if you're talking, well, you're talking two different animals there. The red garnet is also being washed downstream with other heavy minerals. Your 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 black sand, your magnetite, your ilmenite, your uh, zircons. All the heavy minerals tend to settle into the same kind of cracks and fissures that gold would when you're talking placer and river channel. Uh, so they they are related. Um, quartzite. Uh, more well, quartzite is a metamorphic rock. So, so more quartz. You're talking about the hard rock, like the bird's eye quartz samples we just showed you of your normal hard rock vein. So they're, they're kind of two different. You're talking hard rock and placer, with the two different things. So is it fair to say that you sell your gold more by artistic value than by weight? Um, I do. Yeah. Uh, Yes, because the Liberty is known for big gold and we get big nuggets. So I get a higher value there by selling a piece at a time or a few pieces here and there versus uh, selling to a mint who is going to charge you to refine and get rid of the silver. So my nugget value, I, I get a better price for selling individual pieces. How did you get into the gold business to begin with? And the last question. Are you still finding gold? Like, what kind of season have you had the last couple of years? Um, I am still finding gold. I've always, I found one little picker today with the metal detector. I'm still mining all winter long. I'm working in the tunnels today. So uh, the Liberty area has some fantastic gold that has, has been found historically but it's not generally the kind of place you're gonna really make a living at today. I do, I've been doing it 20 years. I kind of know what I'm doing, but it's a, it's, it's a meager existence. It's fun, I love it. Every piece of gold you find, you're the first human to ever set eyes on it. It's a treasure hunt. Um, how I got into it? Well, my mom used to tell this story, she says, Daddy and Robbie went out to Blewett Pass to go looking for gold one day. And Daddy came home. <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> That's my mom's version. <laughs> hey, thanks for your help tonight. My pleasure, Nick. I'd like to shake your hand, but I'm not going to. Everybody, I've got a couple final announcements about uh, the next couple of lectures, and then we'll go to tonight. Hope that you enjoyed that. I certainly did. Hope you learned a few new things. I certainly did. Uh, our schedule is um, five nights a week, but we don't operate here in the backyard on Mondays and Fridays. So tomorrow night's Friday, nothing happening. Uh, but I decided this Saturday and Sunday, we'll be back at it. You know, for the foreseeable future, we're not changing anything culturally here. We're hoping for the best, of course, so I'll just continue with this schedule for, for the foreseeable future. You can see what's going on here Saturday and Sunday night. We're kind of um, taking a turn and going on a much larger scale involving the entire planet. And we're also going back incredible amounts of time. We're going back hundreds of millions of years, even more than a billion years, with supercontinents on Saturday night and this concept called Baja BC and exotic terrains on Sunday night. I'll be ready for you on Saturday and Sunday. I think we need to offer you a toast. Here's to Rob and his good health. Here's to you and your good health and to all of us here on planet Earth. Best wishes to you. Thanks for tuning in. See you Saturday night. Love you.